Dr. Cole has been at the forefront of media and communication technology issues, both in the U.S. and internationally, for the past 25 years. He's an expert in the field of technology and emerging media, and Dr. Cole serves as an advisor to governments and leading companies around the world as they craft digital strategies. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jeffrey Cole to the stage. Thank you. I've been trying to tell the organizers, and I mean it, that only my mother calls me doctor. It's Jeff. And it's always nice to be back here. This sort of reminds me of my sitting room at home. Um, <laughs> if only. Anyway, we got a lot to cover. I have promised to wrap this up by about 1245, so let's not waste any time. So I want to share with you some trends. But before I do that, I want to take about four minutes, tell you about the work I do, so that you can see where my data, my trends come from. I'm an old television guy. I've spent most of my life in and around the world of television, the most powerful medium ever invented. And in the work I did in television, I was always taught that we blew it where television was concerned. We lost a great opportunity. And what I mean by that is television, if you think about it, is the only mass medium we knew ahead of time was, go, was going to be a mass medium. I'll give you guys in a second. Okay. Uh, there was no question in the 40s or 50s that radio listeners were going to love radio with pictures. So since we knew television was going to be a phenomenon before the first signal was even broadcast, what I was taught that we should have done but didn't do is we should have tracked people before they had television and then gone back to them year after year as they acquired and used television to see how it changed their lives. And if we had done that, we would have learned some pretty powerful things, starting with where did the time for television come from? When people were watching three hours of television a day, and we were asked, where did those three hours come from? What are you doing less of? We didn't know. We grabbed that time out of the air. We could have learned if the time for television came from talking as a family, reading books or newspapers, sleep, or from some other place. And in the 90s, I became convinced that digital, first the web and now mobile, was going to be far more powerful than television. So believing that we lost a great opportunity with television and that digital was going to be even more important, 12 years ago we launched this massive project, this tracking of digital that we thought should have been conducted of television in the 40s and 50s. And very briefly, we started in the year 2000 in the United States We've gone back to the same people 12 years in a row. We've watched as non-users move to dial-up, as dial-up users migrated to broadband. We saw almost immediately broadband changed everything, not because of the speed, it was the always on, the direct connection that changed the entire relationship to the web. And we're working with governments around the world about the never users, should we care? Should we be twisting their arms, pushing them online, subsidizing them, or should we let them live their lives peaceably and happily disconnected from the web? We started this work in the US. We're doing it in about 34 countries around the world, throughout Europe, Asia, Latin America. We need to do a little bit more in Africa. We even have a great partner in Iran. So that's a little bit of what I do. And I want to look at some trends we've seen over the last 12 years. I have about 20 different trends, which you're welcome to get on our website or go to our report. But let me take about three or four of what I think are key trends and building on what Kiernan and Jonah have talked about as well. And let's start with video and screen time exploding. In 1975, across the developed world, the average person spent 16 hours a week in front of a screen. Last year, it was 44 hours. The difference was 1975, it was one screen in the home on a schedule, the television set, and last year it was three, or depending on how you count tablets, and we'll get to that in a minute, it was three or four screens in all sorts of places. If you look at, and incidentally, that 44 hours, we think 
will be at 55 hours in the next three to five years. And when you're looking at 55 hours, you're talking about a third of all human time. And in there, there should be some time for sleep as well. So it's about more than a third of all of our awake time. If you look at teenagers, there's practically not a moment of their life, except when they're in school and asleep, that they're not in front of a screen. And I'm not so sure they're not in front of a screen when they're in school. They certainly are during lunch and recess. And I think more of them are in front of a screen during class than we'd like to admit. And regarding sleep, we know that 80% of teenagers sleep next to their mobile phones. You ask them why they sleep next to their mobile phones, they'll give you one simple, obvious, direct answer. And then there's a second reason that's slightly more complex that they may not even be aware of. The simple, easy answer, why do you sleep next to your mobile phone? It's my alarm clock. We and everybody else learned 12 years ago teenagers weren't wearing watches. I made the comment back in 2000 that now the entire jewelry industry, not to mention the economy of Switzerland, is waiting to the answer to the question, will they start wearing watches when they get into their 20s and 30s? Well, we've been tracking them for 12 years. They're still not wearing watches. The 30-year-olds we track who were 18 aren't wearing them. Now, this isn't a problem for Rolex. Nobody spends $10,000 on a watch because it tells better time. <laughs> they spend $10,000. If all you want is something that tells good time, you can spend $10. They spend $10,000 or more on a watch because it makes them feel better about themselves or sends a message to the world. The other reason that they're sleeping next to their mobile phone, mo many of you work in agencies know this, an acronym. You may not know what the acronym stands for, but I bet most of you do. Uh, but the acronym FOMO, fear of missing out. The fear that something is happening in their social life and they're not going to know about it and the best way to know about it is to have it be the last thing they do before they go to sleep, the first thing they do when they get up in the morning and if they wake up in the middle of the night, the thing they do in the middle of the night. So now we're seeing screen time explode and the reason screen time is exploding is because for the first time video has left the home. If you think about television, television couldn't grow until now. Because for most of our lives, television dominated our at-home awake time. Most of us turned the television set on the moment we entered the home, left it on till we went to sleep. Some of us went to sleep with it on. Some of us even leave it on when we're not at home so that people think we are at home. The only way screen time or television or video time could have increased was to leave the home. And television never existed outside the home until now. The exception was the hospital. If you're sick, that's your home. The bar, for some people, that's their home. But now we're seeing screen time explode. And as we do, we're seeing the ratings for live television events go through the roof. This year's Super Bowl became the highest rated television program of all time, breaking the previous record, which was last year's Super Bowl, which broke a 28-year record, which was the last episode of MASH in 1983. We're seeing the ratings for live sporting events climb, but also the ratings for live events of all kind, award shows, the Grammys, the Emmys, not the Oscars, but that's because they hired those two awful co-hosts. Um, but we're seeing all these ratings rise. And the reason for that, and you got a little bit of this out of Kiernan's presentation, is co-viewing. We're watching with other people. Well, we've always watched television with other people, but until now, the other people had to be in the room with us at the same time. Now we're watching with other people when they're not in the room with us. I think we're going to see in the next two years the little crawl at the bottom of the screen that has a supplemental news source. I think we're going to see that turn into a social media feed where we're going to put through our cell phones or our tablets or our internet-enabled television sets, we're going to put our feelings and share it with our friends who are watching it with us. I think one of the great killer apps that's probably so killer, it's going to end up being free, 
is going to be an app for a PVR, DVR, or TiVo, which now close to 50% of us have, that are going to let us record a television event, agree to watch it at the same time, and then it will synchronize our DVRs so we can watch it delayed as if it's live and then share. Three numbers from our research that didn't change for 10 years until last year. The three numbers that didn't change, seven, that didn't change, 70 percent of people regularly went from the internet to television. They saw something on the internet that drove them to television. Just as many went from television to the internet. But until last year, only 14 percent were ever online watching television at the same time with related content. That doesn't count watching television while answering your email, which is just multitasking. Only 14 percent were ever watching Survivor while they were on the Survivor website. That number has tripled to 42 percent in the last year and a half. And we think it's going to become the standard way people watch television. A second trend that I haven't talked about since 2002, because there was nothing useful to say in the last 10 years, is e-commerce. In 2000, 2001, I was talking about e-commerce all the time because we saw people were afraid to buy online. They were afraid they couldn't trust the merchant. They were afraid the product wouldn't be delivered or it'd be delivered damaged, that it was too difficult to return, and they hated the lack of a live human being in the sales process. Within two years, by 2002, all of those things were reversed. People found they could trust the merchant, and if they couldn't, they could just call their credit card and have the charges removed. If the product, they didn't like it or it was delivered damaged, in many cases, it was easier to return than taking it back to the store, because all you had to do was print out a label and hand it to your letter carrier. And the lack of a live human being in the sales process was quickly transformed from one of the things people liked the least about buying online to one of the things they liked the most about buying online. They didn't want a live human being in the process. That slowed it down unless they had a problem. If they had a problem, then they wanted an 800 number and somebody they could talk to to fix the problem. So for the next nine or 10 years, the only headline, the reason I haven't talked about it till now, the only headline was e-commerce growing, more people buying, spending more per purchase and more per year, all of that very important, but not all that interesting. But in the last year, we've seen some very profound changes in e-commerce. First, the types of things people are buying. Now they're buying toothpaste, deodorant, floss, batteries. Half the diapers in America are now sold online. Because the thing about diapers is you need them from the day you need them till the day you don't need them. <laughs> and that can be one year or four years, depending on your parental philosophies of toilet training. <laughs> diapers, are, they're not heavy, but they're big and bulky. And instead of having to put them in the trunk of your car and bring them into the house, they can be delivered to your front door. They're cheaper. If you're talking about adult diapers, you avoid the embarrassment factor. They're sold on subscription models, where Amazon or others figure out how many you need and send them to you at that rate. You can adjust them up or down. But I was thinking about this. About two months ago, I was talking to one of the biggest pet supply stores in the country. And I was talking about all of what's happening with diapers, and they were listening, and they were really interested. And I said, wait a minute. Don't you get it? Pet food. That if you're going to buy diapers online, pet food, which, which you need from the day you need it till the unhappy day you don't need it, if you have a big dog, can be 50 pounds of dog food, and having it delivered to your door, so now we're going to see the only reason to go to your local store, now that we have Amazon Prime, and Amazon Prime, as I'm sure most of you know, $79 for unlimited second day shipping, 
What a lot of people don't know is you can actually pay an extra $4 per package and get next day shipping. But unlimited second day shipping, which is brilliant because it feels like it's free. It's not free, you pay the $79, but once you pay it, you can use it every day if you want. And Amazon, always trying to take care of the other parts of its business, throws in thousands of hours of video, movies, and television so that they can push up the Kindle part of the business you get with Prime as well. But now the only reason with Amazon Prime to go to the local Rite Aid or CVS, or if you live in New York, Dwayne Reed, is because you need the product in the next 48 hours. But that's changing. As, as Californians, most of you are Californians, you know that Amazon didn't collect sales tax in California, which really was, in my opinion, unfair to the brick and mortar stores, but my God, did I take advantage of the lack of sales tax. <laughs> so finally, the state of California, which had been going broke, oh, there's a great story in the uh, New York Times today that says we may finally in California be over the hurdle and good times are ahead, let's hope, uh, but we know California's been going broke, losing $300 million a year to Amazon, not charging sales tax. And a year and a half ago, the state threatened to sue Amazon. And Amazon refused to cooperate. They said, we're going to get an initiative on the ballot, and we'll let the voters decide. And you can imagine how the voters would have decided whether they wanted to pay sales tax on Amazon. And then all of a sudden, Without saying anything, Amazon changed its mind and said, as of September 15th, 2012, we'll start collecting sales tax. Now, why did they do that? Did they do that because they were a good corporate citizen? Did they do that because they love California and they want to see it be a better state? I think we all know better. The reason they did it, really interesting, some of you may have now followed this on your own, the reason they did it was based on the 1990 Supreme Court case, which said if you have a brick and mortar presence in the state, you have to collect sales tax on your mail order purchases, your phone purchases, and eventually your internet purchases. So to avoid that, Amazon put its fulfillment centers in Delaware, Wyoming, Montana, all these tiny out of the way places. Once they agreed to start collecting sales tax in California, they're now building a huge fulfillment center in Fullerton. They're building one in Brooklyn, surrounding New York, just outside of Chicago, just outside of San Francisco. And why are they doing that? Same day delivery. Amazon is now preparing within two years that you order a product online by 10 o'clock in the morning and it will be delivered to your door by 6 o'clock at night. Now, that's never going to be all 50 United States. It'll probably be 80% of the population. You'll never be able to get that in remote Alaska, or maybe anywhere in Alaska. <laughs> but they haven't figured out how they're going to price it compared to the $79 for second day. But think about a world of same-day delivery. All of a sudden, the only reason to go to the local drugstore is if you need a product in the next six hours. What Amazon has already done to merchants, just think of one example. Think about 1998, 14 years ago. One of the biggest movies of the year, I'm sure most of you saw it, You've Got Mail with Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan, Meg, Meg Ryan in her last cute role. <laughs> Sad, but I love Meg Ryan. But she decided she wanted to be a serious actress, and sadly, it just didn't work. Uh, but 1998, Meg Ryan owns the little mom and pop bookstore, and Tom Hanks, who she falls in love with, his family are the Barnes and Noble although they don't call, they're called Fox, it's a fictitious name, and they own the chain bookstore, The Predator. What well, didn't even take 14 years, it took about 10 years that the mom and pop, in most instances, long gone, and now The Predator, the Barnes and Noble, has become the prey. 
chain bookstores, Borders is gone. Although I was in Dubai last week and I saw Borders and I actually walked in and asked and they said they just bought the name from the chain and they survive as a little franchise, but still the same logo. But Borders is gone. Barnes and Noble, if they survive, will survive um, as, I think, the Nook Company. It's remarkable. That's just one example. We could get into how many other industries have been turned upside down. But I think if you want to know who's the successor to Steve Jobs as the smartest guy in the room, the guy who can see around corners and whose personality is just as unpleasant, it's <laughs> true. It's not Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple. It's Jeff Bezos. Bezos is moving in so many different directions. What we're describing with e-commerce is one third of how he's taking over the world. There's also the Kindle, which this week just released their iPad size Kindle. And of course, they have a Kindle that's priced considerably less than even the iPad mini. And then it's their Amazon Web Services, which some of my friends think is the most powerful entity of all three taking over web services for government operations and companies, but we'll see. But Bezos last year spent $4 billion on shipping and collected $2 billion in shipping fees and couldn't be happier because it's building instinctive behavior. It's building habit. Now Bezos is saying, if I'm going to spend $4 to deliver a package to your door, I don't want it to contain $3 worth of batteries. I want it to have a $1,000 dress. And he's moved aggressively into the fashion industry, making deals with fashion warehouses to deliver fashion. He's now getting into the wine business. And I think the business, he hasn't announced this, and has, I think the business he's really coveting taking over is the selling of automobiles. I think they're going to go to automobile dealerships. They're going to say, you don't need 13 Chevrolet dealerships in greater Los Angeles, because all of your dealerships need to be our service centers, and you need three or four of them. We'll take all the salesmen away. We'll take the whole sales function. If somebody wants to buy a Chevy, they'll go online, make an appointment. We'll deliver a salesperson and a car to their front door. They can test drive it, and if they want to buy it, they'll go online. I don't know if it can be delivered in two days or not. But I think they're going to take over all the buying, all the selling of automobiles around the world. Um, building on the multi-platform world we, we talked about in the beginning, uh, let me talk a little bit about tablets. I think iPads are transformational. Invite me back in a year or two and I might change that to tablets are transformational. But right now, I think it's iPads that are transformational. Hewlett Packard, Samsung, Motorola, RIM, they've had two and a half years to try to catch up with the iPad, and they haven't. The only people who have caught up with Apple and the iPad are Apple themselves with the iPad 2, the iPad 3, which they call the new iPad, and then unexpectedly they slid into the mini iPad announcement, the iPad 4, that nobody was expecting. It's almost as if the goalposts have been moved before the other team even took the field. I have friends who work at Apple who say off the record, and at Apple you have to speak off the record, because if you ever spoke on the record, you could be killed. <laughs> and that's only a slight exaggeration. They say off the record that last year, in March of 2011, when they were introducing the iPad 2, they were planning to drop the price by $150 to $200. But they looked around and they said, nobody's beating us on features. Nobody's beating us on price. Why bother? And if you look, they were right. Later in the year, in August of 2011, Hewlett Packard introduced their touchpad. And their touchpad was priced exactly the same as the introductory lowest level iPad, $499 for 16 gigabytes Wi-Fi. 
So they introduced their touchpad in August. Consumers looked at it and said, who cares? Realizing they had made a mistake, three weeks later they dropped the price by $100 to $399. Consumers looked at it again and said, who cares? Realizing they had made such a big mistake, they made this earth-shaking decision to shut down the entire PC division at Hewlett Packard, a decision they since have rethought, and they fired their CEO over it, and they dropped the price of the touchpad to $99. Finally, consumers looked at it and said, I care, and they bought it. The problem for Hewlett Packard, it cost them $309 to make a touchpad. So the lesson is clear, you're willing to lose $210 per unit, you've got a great business. <laughs> and of course the way you compensate for that, as I'm sure you all know, is volume, volume, volume. So the iPad comes out in the spring of 2010. My job was to look at this thing and say, is this the fourth screen or does it replace the second screen? I think we all count screens the same way, but just to be sure, the television set, as we said earlier, the first screen, the computer's the second screen, the smartphone's the third screen, movie theater owners have been complaining, hey, we're the fourth screen, but nobody takes that seriously, <laughs> Pro probably because you don't own that screen. So is the iPad or the tablet the fourth screen or does it replace the second? I firmly believe it replaces the second for everybody except four to six percent of the population. I think four to six percent of people will always, or for the foreseeable future, will use computers. Those are the computer assisted designers, the heavy duty number crunchers, the big writers, maybe, the co maybe college students while they're in college. But to the rest of us, a computer is a needlessly complex device, can take five minutes to boot, is much too difficult to learn, and one out of every 20 times, let's be charitable, encounters the blue screen of death. <laughs> Whereas an iPad is something that is not complex to learn. You hand an iPad to a three-year-old boy or an 83-year-old grandmother, and within five minutes, both of them will be using it. The only difference is within five minutes, the three-year-old boy will be teaching you things you didn't know. It boots instantly. If you turn it off for getting to do something, you don't have to say to yourself, as you do with your computer, is it important enough? Do I want to sit while it boots again? You go back into an iPad literally in a second, and there's no blue screen of death. I don't know anyone, and I bet this describes lots of you, but we'll see. I don't know anyone who owns an iPad and a laptop who, when they're going on a trip, doesn't look at their laptop and then look at their iPad and then look at their laptop and say, can I leave you at home? <laughs> and what they're saying is, I want to leave you at home, but they're going through their head all the things they're going to do but keep in mind the biggest limitations on the iPad come not from the device itself, they came from the stubbornness of Steve Jobs. The refusal to have Adobe Flash, the iPad could have Adobe Flash in an instant. That was Jobs declaring war on Adobe, a war he won just before he died. The refusal to have a USB port or an SD port there's no reason it couldn't have one of those ports. That was Jobs wanting to completely control the environment. But now two things have changed. One, sadly, is Jobs is gone. Jobs, for example, used to make fun of the idea of a mini screen. But since he's gone, new management was able to say, we need a mini. And incidentally, I think they're going to be vindicated. They charged $329 while the Google and Kindle comparable models are $199, I think consumers are going to decide that a million apps are worth $129. Initial sales say I'm right, but we'll see what happens long term.
but first Jobs is now gone. Walter Isaacson, his biographer, said that Jobs' fingerprints will be on everything Apple did or does for two years from his death. Well, it's now almost 14 months, which means the iPhone 5 was Jobs. The Mini wasn't, we know that. But it means we will have about 10 more months of Jobs' influence on Apple, and they may begin to really change. One last thing about tablets, they change the way we interact with this technology. I gave a talk at the World Mobile Congress earlier this year. Four people used the same example. They weren't stealing from each other, they just experienced the same thing. Four people talked about their very young children going to the television set, going like this, and then saying, Daddy, why is it broken? And of course it's broken, because the real way you interact with technology is not through mice or a keyboard, it's with your body. Some of you may have seen a, a, a video on YouTube. Some people said it was faked, maybe it was. Earlier this year, showed a one-year-old girl sitting with a magazine on her lap, going like this, getting frustrated when nothing happened. Because things are supposed to happen. Microsoft, a company we don't usually give much credit for for innovation, a reputation they deserve, um, <laughs> has come out with what I think is the second most important device of the 21st century, the Kinect. The Kinect, where they probably made a brilliant and simultaneously an unwise decision to make it an Xbox attachment, a gaming attachment, the brilliance of that was they sold over 15 million of them in the first couple of months because they hit the Xbox base. The foolish part of that is they sort of stereotyped the Kinect as a gaming device when it's so much more. It takes over 240 photographs of your body, so you don't need passwords. Nobody can fake what your body is. You can do what you can do with medicine, what you can do with business is astonishing. And with the Connect, parents don't have to say to their kids, turn the set off and go outside and get some exercise. The Connect is exhausting. It's physically, you're moving and it's all over. One last trend, which I know describes me and I think describes everybody in the television and media industry, sadly, uh, is a very powerful new trend. It also happens to be sort of fun. We find nobody wants to give up the internet. There are things about the internet we don't like, spyware, viruses, spam, none of that caused people to leave. I mentioned 2% drop off the web each year. That's not out of dissatisfaction. That's people who change jobs and lose access at work. That's people whose PCs break and either haven't gotten around to buying a new one or can't afford to, and they come back online, usually within a couple of months. So nobody gives up the internet out of dissatisfaction, but we're tired of it defining our lives. We're tired of it, even though it's wireless, of it being an umbilical cord or a ball and chain. What some of us know we couldn't leave the office if we didn't have our iPhones or Blackberries. Some of us know we couldn't go on vacation if we couldn't be reached, but that doesn't mean we have to be reached every minute of our vacation. We're looking for balance. We're looking for ways to enjoy the benefits of all this technology without experiencing all the disadvantages. And we've given this a name. We call this enough already, E-N-U-F-F. -F. And a couple of examples of enough already, sometimes I can't go to sleep until I answer all my email. And you know what happens if I answer all my email just before I go to sleep? Damn it, while I'm sleeping, everybody answers me. And it's all sitting there when I wake up in the morning, and it never goes away. I'm like the, ma the, the, the mouse on the wheel. Second example, when we talk to people who use the internet at work, 75% say it has made them more productive. 5% say it has made them less productive. And 20% say it hasn't made any difference at all. So three quarters say it's made them more productive. And those people make comments like, now I can do in 30 hours what it used to take 40 hours to do. And that's true. 
but the problem is nobody's working 30 hours and calling it a week. We're taking on more work than we've ever taken on before. We're working Saturday mornings, Sunday nights, Christmas Eve, New Year's Day. Sometimes I hear employers comp complain about the amount of time their employees spend at the office online doing personal things. Every time I hear that, I say, you should close your mouth because we see for every hour an employee spends at the office online doing something personal, they're spending three hours at home doing work related to their jobs. Another example of enough already is device fatigue. I live in Los Angeles, but I just got back a couple days ago. I'm embarrassed to admit that in my suitcase, there are eight charger cables. <laughs> but the best example of this I've ever seen is my friend who sent his 16-year-old daughter over the summer to London. And she was on a school tour. Since it was a school tour, it was three girls to a room in older, less expensive hotels. These three 16-year-old girls got to their room in London and discovered to their absolute horror there was one electrical outlet in the room. Three 16-year-old girls, three digital cameras, one iPad, one Kindle, one laptop, one camcorder, two Bluetooth earpieces, and three hair dryers. Although, in fairness, a hair dryer doesn't have to be charged. They actually had to set the clock for every 90 minutes throughout the night so they could get up and remove devices and plug in new ones. But the problem is most devices don't charge in 90 minutes. My iPad takes six or seven hours. So as one girl's less than fully charged device was being removed, she'd scream, wait, stop. It was like Lord of the Flies in there. <laughs> and incidentally, if you, if you look at Hurricane Sandy, which was a devastating hurricane in the New York area, with 39th Street, roughly the division, and many people, below, most of those below 39th lost power, one of the biggest problems they had was there was no way to charge their devices. And the people above 39th Street actually opened their homes, as did Mayor Cory Booker in Newark, so that people could come in and charge their devices because their lives couldn't move forward without tablets or without smartphones. But in the, in, the, in the 80s, I remember there were a bunch of silly people, Donald Trump, he still is, of course, Michael, Michael Milken, and they used to brag about the fact that they only slept two or three hours a night. The argument sort of was sleeping is wasting time, it's time you're not making money, and of course we know that sleeping is actually essential to being healthy and productive. But they used to brag about how little sleep they got. And then a few years ago, I heard Jeff Bezos bragging about the fact that he gets nine hours a night sleep. And that's really how things have changed. Now, if you're powerful, you can disconnect because people will find you. You don't always have to be connected. The New York Times is trying to coin a new phrase, building on FOMO that I talked about before. It hasn't caught on yet. But the New York Times is trying to coin JOMO. And JOMO is the joy of missing out. And the joy of missing out is when you can say, I'm secure enough, I'm important enough, I could turn it off, and whatever it is, they'll wait for me and they'll find me. I think we're going to see a lot more of JOMO in the coming years. Those are a couple of the trends we look at. Yeah, wisely, I was not given four and a half hours to talk. If I had, we would talk about changes in newspapers, which sadly are going away, powerful changes in social media, and uh, how marketers use social media. When I, when I get to talk to brands, which is most of the time, talking about how their learning curve has to be steeper than their action curve. Love to share all of that at a different time in a different place. You're welcome to go to our website, which is just digitalcenter.org.
but it is absolutely a pleasure to be here. What a gorgeous facility. It doesn't remind me of my sitting room, unfortunately. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>